Hey everybody and welcome back to Jim's Garage. I hope you had a great Christmas and we've still got New Year's to come. I'm really excited for this video because it's going to be the first in a three-pot series where I walk you through how I choose, build and configure a NAS or possibly even a server. More on that to come but basically this is a bit of a powerhouse and it's more affordable and more capable than you might think. So this isn't just going to be another NAS video and I'll come on to that shortly but before I do get onto the parts I have a few constraints that I wanted to work within so let's walk through those first because hopefully many of them are probably similar to some of the things that you want to have in your NAS or your server. So this video starts off by a family member requiring a NAS to back up some of their important data. Now they're not technically gifted so this needs to be remotely manageable. So that was one of the first things I'll want to do and that will be more in the configuration side. But moreover this needed to be cheap, it needed to be reliable, it needed to be reasonably powerful and expandable if necessary. Now there's quite a lot to get through in that and I'll come on to that in the next section. But the overarching things here were it needed to be on modern, new hardware because I want this to be out in the field as long as possible without any issues. Now there's a wealth of secondhand kit out there which I typically tend to use for myself because I think it's good to recycle where possible but as this was out in the field I've kind of let that slip. But I haven't gone for enterprise gear because that's super expensive. I've gone for consumer gear but with a twist. This machine also needs to have a GPU and that's because I want the person on the receiving end of this. If I want to do remote diagnosis they're capable of sticking a HDMI cable in here, getting some output and getting this up on a screen for me. Most of this stuff is going to be managed through WireGuard that I'll do remotely, but when that fails, it's good to be able to revert back to a keyboard, mouse and monitor. Now, one of the first things to decide was whether to go X Enterprise Gear or New Consumer. Now, I chose New Consumer, but that does mean that we have to let slip of a few nice-to-haves. So things like out-of-band management, iDRAC, ITME, ELO, those sorts of things, we're not going to get those. So that is something to bear in mind. However, all of the other things that you probably would want, so a GPU, ECC memory, we're going to get that stuff. And I'll show you how I came to be able to do that with consumer parts. The next thing to decide was, which team do I bat for? Do I go Intel or do I go AMD? Now, hands up, I've never built an AMD machine. But that changes now, and I'm really excited to do it. But how did I come to this conclusion? I've always liked the Intel machines, they seem to have worked, but by now it's pretty clear that they're not front runners, certainly when it comes to things like efficiency, power draw, and even raw performance, dare I say it. Now, to take that a step further, and within my constraints, I wanted this to have ECC memory and a GPU. So you can do that with 12th and 13th gen Intel, but you're going to require a W680 motherboard. Now that's a workstation motherboard and prices for those typically start at about four to five hundred pounds in the UK. That just blows my budget out before I've even started. So that pretty much in one fell swoop ruled out Intel. So then I started to have a look at AMD. Now AMD is interesting because all of their consumer parts support ECC but it's a little bit more complicated than that because remember I wanted a GPU. So if you took something like a 5600 that supports ECC and even the cheap motherboards with a B550 chipset they also support ECC. But to get a GPU and come in under budget I needed an APU. That's basically AMD's term for having an integrated GPU. Now, frustratingly, if you want an APU, you cannot have ECC, unless you go for a Ryzen Pro CPU. The downside is Ryzen Pro CPUs are not off the shelf. They are OEM chips that you need to buy secondhand. So whilst I stated I wanted everything new, the CPU is the only thing I've had to buy secondhand. But I bought that online from a reputable retailer that comes with a warranty. So I'm pretty happy that it's going to be reliable and I'm not going to have issues with it. 
And even if I do, I've got that warranty to fall back on. So I landed on the Ryzen 5 Pro 5650G. This gives me the performance I wanted. It's gonna give me six cores, 12 threads, a pass mark of almost 20,000, which is basically the same as my Dell R730, which has 20 cores and 40 threads. It's gonna draw a maximum of 65 watts compared to my Dell, which can draw easily over 200 watts. It's gonna give me ECC memory support, but it's only gonna give me 20 PCIe lanes versus the 80 I get from my Dell. So whilst I did say that the out of band management is something to consider, you're also gonna to have to work with the constraints of only having 20 PCIe lanes. Now for me in this setup where it's gonna be remote and it's basically a glorified NAS with plenty of horsepower should they want it, that isn't a problem. But this might be something that you want to consider in the future. So I wanna to touch a little bit more on why I'm calling this a NAS and a server. Well, to me, the two are interchangeable, certainly within a home lab environment. In the enterprise setup, yeah, it makes sense to abstract your storage from your compute. But in the home lab, we don't necessarily have that luxury. We often want to consolidate, we often want to have power savings, we often want to have cost expenses to a minimum. So that means consolidation. So you could absolutely use the machine that I'm gonna show you today to be your all-in-one home lab. It's got, like I say, 20,000 pass mark, it's got an iGPU, it supports ECC memory, and it could be all that you need to have your all-in-one home lab NAS. So now that I have the CPU sorted, which for many intents and purposes is basically a server CPU, pretty much a workstation CPU, it was time to get onto the motherboard. Now, there are a plethora of motherboards to choose in the AMD space, ranging from the more premium models down to the bottom rung. Now, I try to go sort of in the middle tier and try to tick as many things as I can get. Obviously for this build, durability was gonna be one of the key factors, as well as the number of potential SATA ports that I could use and support for ECC memory. Thankfully, most of those things were taken care of because I chose the B550 chipset, which is pretty much the same no matter what vendor you go for. Specifically, I've chosen to go for the ASRock B550M Pro 4. This is a micro ATX motherboard, so it's somewhere between the ITX and a full ATX, so it's gonna give me some size savings without having to skimp on the actual feature set. I could have gone down for an ITX and that probably would have been sufficient. However, you do start to pay a premium for the smaller form factor, which is quite ironic because there's fewer materials, but I guess it probably takes more R&D to actually get everything into a small package. So spending a lot of time and satisfying all of the things I needed, i.e. things like the ECC and the SATA connections, the durability was a key factor. And from all of the in-depth technical reviews I've seen about this in terms of power management, the quality of the capacitors, etc., the heat dissipation, quality of heat sinks, etc., I think this is a really good fit. And I've actually used ASRock motherboards for a while, both their consumer, I'm currently using one now to record this video, and also in their workstation builds, where I've had a server running for about seven years now without a hitch. So I'm relatively confident that this motherboard is gonna be a really good fit, and it's not gonna give me problems. I'm hoping this thing can just be shoved in a cupboard and I don't ever have to worry about it. Next, we're gonna get onto memory. Now, as I mentioned, one of my requirements was ECC memory. Now, there's a lot of debate around ECC in the home lab, and I kind of lean on the side of, if it's just a home lab outside of a NAS, I don't have a problem with not using ECC memory. I often regularly back stuff up, and it should be okay from that standpoint. However, yes, I could be backing up corrupted data, but when it comes to the actual NAS, where all my storage happens, I do always go for ECC. That's because I care about my data and I probably care just as much if not more when I'm responsible for somebody else's data. So that's why I absolutely had to choose ECC memory. Now, because of the CPU and motherboard I've chosen, that's supported and I chose to go with a reputable brand. I went with Kingston. Now, as I'll come on to later, 
I'm only going to be using two hard drives and a maximum of four terabytes of storage. That's all they needed and you could easily expand this and we'll come on to that later. But because of that I don't actually need too much memory. So I've just chosen two 8 gigabyte sticks of Kingston server memory with ECC and it's just 2400 megahertz. So it's nothing fancy, it's nothing flash and that came in really cheap at about £40 which was excellent. There's not a great deal to say about that other than it's going to give me both CPU support for ECC and it's going to give me the memory support. So I shouldn't get any nasty bit flips anywhere and all of their data is going to stay exactly as they want it to which is great for me. <laughs> Next we get on to probably what you're most associating and as with and that's the storage. Now for the storage the actual requirements from them wasn't too much. They're basically storing some photographs and some postcard pictures that they take. That's their hobby. And for that I'm only going to go with four terabytes. So that's two four terabytes. I'm going to put that in a RAID just to mirror that data. Obviously then I'm going to manage this with something like TrueNAS or maybe TrueNAS in Proxmox. We'll come on to that later. But that's going to give me more than enough space for them to work with because I know how many drives they've got lying around and external drives etc. And 4 terabytes is absolutely tons of headroom for what they need. And if you've watched any of my previous videos I've got it pre-configured with a 321 backup strategy. So anything that's added to this NAS is automatically replicated into their cloud account. So we should be covered in any eventuality. For peace of mind, I wanted some enterprise hard drives. So I've chosen the Iron Wolf Pro series and that gives me 256 megabytes of cache, 7200 RPM. So it's gonna be pretty reliable, pretty fast for a hard disk drive and a total usable storage of four terabytes when all is said and done. Now that's going to take up two of the six SATA ports, so I've got plenty of room to expand this if needed. And the motherboard also comes with a times 16 slot, which can be bifurcated into two times eight. So that means theoretically I could easily stick another 16 drives on top of the six drives to give me what? A maximum of 22 drives plus two NVMEs as well. So I don't think storage is ever going to be a problem. Now for the actual OS itself and not the data, be it Proxmox or TrueNAS, I'm not yet decided. I've chosen the tried and true Crucial MX 500s, which I've recommended before and I've been using for a number of years. I'm only going with one. It's only going to be 250 gigs, but you could obviously extend that to what you want. These drives are well reviewed. They've got decent reliability. I've never had a problem with one of mine, so I feel pretty comfortable in choosing this to be put in a remote system that's probably never going to be touched by the actual user. Now for the PSU, I wanted a trusted brand because this thing's going to be on for its entire life basically. I didn't need any crazy power limits because we've only got a CPU and a couple of drives in this thing. And to meet all of those requirements, I chose something I'm used to. I chose the Corsair CX500. The CX series is kind of their mid-tier. It's a good balance between ultimate efficiency, which comes at a price, and some of the cheaper things that I just wanted to stay away from because lower efficiency, probably not good components, probably not going to last as long. I might be wandering off piece with that one, but I felt happy with what I bought here and what I paid for it. And anecdotally, I've got three Corsair PSUs that have been on for almost seven years now, and not one of them has blown. That's a super small sample size, I get it, but I feel comfortable in going with this choice. And I've also had to RMA stuff in the past, and it's been a really simple process. So that just about wraps up all of the components that are gonna go into this machine. The only other things that I wanted to add to this was a decent cooler. So I went with a Noctua NHD9L, that's a bit of a premium product for this CPU, but I actually had one lying around. I'm pretty confident you could get away with something like a stock cooler or something mildly more premium like one of the Arctic coolers, for example. But pretty much pending a disaster, a CPU cooler is a CPU cooler. And for its intended work purposes, i.e. predominantly being a NAS, I didn't need anything fancy. Now, if you're going to be using this as your NAS slash server, you might want to invest in something like I have, that Noctua. That's going to be more than sufficient for cooling this 65 watt CPU 
And I use Noctu as in all of my builds and I've never had a fan fail in 10 years. I'm probably getting close pushing those limits, but hey, I think everybody knows from their reputation why you pay the price you do. Now the last thing to get was the case. Now thankfully I had one lying around, but I recommend if you don't have one, just look on eBay, look on Facebook Marketplace, or hell, even go down to the tip. Every time I go down to the tip, I have a look in the electrics bin, there's always discarded computers in there, and you could just rip everything out and just take the case home with a few screws, etc. You're probably good to go due to common form factors that haven't changed in decades. So there you go. That's my NAS with a twist. I think this makes the perfect inroad to your first home server or NAS. It's got graphics and it's got ECC memory in a consumer package, which is pretty non-standard for those who don't want to scratch beneath the surface and don't understand that things like the consumer grade G CPUs for AMD don't support ECC. I'm really looking forward to building this machine and that's what I'm going to be covering in my next video. I'm just waiting for a few of the items to arrive and then I'm going to show you how I put this together. Hopefully you'll learn a few things but maybe it'll just be confirmation that you're doing it right or hey you might go what the hell are you doing Jim? That's not how you do that and therefore that might be quite useful for me. So let me know what you think about this build. Let me know if it's something that you might consider building in the future. I'm really starting to question now whether I want to keep my existing Dell R730. It's pretty power hungry. I think it's been great to play with to get the out of bound memory support. To have 80 PCIe lanes is great, but the energy consumption is leaves a lot to be desired. And actually it gets trounced by things that cost a hundred pounds these days. Um, yeah, it's got me thinking, especially with the new 8,000 APUs that are coming out in January. I'm really keen to see what I can do there. I might even create a new triple clustered Proxmox using the 8000 series. That's a video for another day. Anyway, I hope you like this. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you found this useful, please give it a like, hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody.